Welcome to, thanks for that. Hi everyone. Welcome to this evening's Emerging Leaders Network event, civic engagement from the perspectives of indigenous leaders. Can everybody hear me? Can I get some thumbs up? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, my name is Carly Lennox, pronouns she and her, and I'm a member of the ELN Executive Committee, and I also work as a senior communications advisor and project manager at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Before we begin, I'll quickly go through the agenda for tonight's evening. Um, after a land acknowledgement and then followed by some housekeeping, we'll jump into our panel discussion, which promises to be a really interesting conversation based on the fantastic panelists who have agreed to join us tonight. Um, and then in the last 30 to 40 minutes, uh, the panelists will take questions from the audience. Um, so feel free to send your questions in through the Q&A box throughout the evening. We anticipate wrapping up around 8 p.m. Uh, so to begin, I'd just like to uh, situate myself and the land I'm currently standing on. And I welcome all of you to also share who you are and where you're tuning in from um, tonight by writing a message in the chat. Thank you for that. So I'm joining this conversation as a settler uh, with ancestors who came from the East Coast, uh, from uh, came to the East Coast from Western Europe, mainly Scotland and Ireland. So my ancestors came here for better opportunities somewhere around 150 years ago or so. And since that time, better opportunities for me and my family came as a result of policies of racism, genocide, forced relocation, et cetera. Um, of the original inhabitants and caretakers of this land since time immemorial, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. The land I'm situated on right now is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. I understand that um, when the homes in my neighborhood went up in around 1860, um, the, uh, the colonial records at that time noted this, this area as a council grounds for the Mississaugas of the New Credit, as they were called at that time. Today, where I am in the West End of Toronto and throughout the GTHA, um, is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and they continue to live here with resilience despite the historical and ongoing oppression, violence, and inequities they face. My commitment is to continue listening to, their, to those voices and learning from First Nations Inuit and Métis peoples. And I'm currently focusing my efforts on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action numbers 18 to 24 around healthcare. Um, I'll also share some key points from Civic Actions Land Acknowledgement and uh, these ones really ring true for me as well. So we believe in the spirit of the dish with one spoon concept that land can be shared to the mutual benefit of all its inhabitants. We also recognize the non-settlers and the displanted, such as people of African descent who are brought here forcibly and enslaved and who continue to face oppression and inequality on land that is not their own. Our role as a civic convener and in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, civic action is committed to rebuilding and renewing respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. We support Indigenous sovereignty and we commit uh, the, we support the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. For me, it's important to start our conversation off this way because tonight, for example, uh, we're going to be exploring civic engagement from the perspectives of Indigenous leaders, and it's impossible to separate out that history and the ongoing oppression from the current realities that impact the civic landscape here in our region today and across the country we call Canada. So um, now I'm just going to quickly go over, um, before we jump into that discussion, I'll go over some of our tech reminders. Uh, please send in your comments, your ideas, your resources into the chat, and just make sure to select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see what you put in there. As I mentioned, the last 30 minutes or so of today's discussion will be open to your questions, so please send in your questions to the Q&A box, um, and then vote on the questions you most want to hear the answers to. So the questions with the most votes will get prioritized, will get pushed to the top. If anyone has technical difficulties, please send a message to Aman. 
our tech support today from Civic Action. And for closed captioning, you can just click on show subtitles under closed captioning. Everyone should see that at the top of their screen. Now, just a quick overview of who we are as the Emerging Leaders Network. Um, as I understand, we have a lot of new folks joining us this evening, which is wonderful. Uh, we are a network of over 3,000 rising leaders from across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. We are passionate about making an impact in our region. Joining our network is free and it's open to anyone who identifies as someone who's trying to work for better in their community, their workplace, or anywhere else. We offer monthly programming around leadership development and city building. And speaking of which, um, ELN Studio is coming up right around the corner and everyone in our network has access to this awesome skills building by annual conference. So now I'll introduce you to our exciting uh, moderator and panel members for this evening's discussion. First up is Deborah Richardson. Deborah was appointed Deputy Minister of Treasury Board Secretariat Secretary of Treasury Board and Management Board of Cabinet and Chair of the Public Service Commission in July, 2021. Pre previously, she served as Deputy Solicitor General for Correctional Services and as a Deputy Minister of Inter um, Indigenous Affairs. Uh, Deborah is a seasoned inter intergovernmental affairs executive and Indigenous relationships expert. Deborah is a proud Mi'kmaq woman with strong ties to her home community in Pabino First Nation on the North Shore of New Brunswick. Deborah and her husband, Bob, are proud parents of five children. Uh, next is Lori Hermiston. Lori is an Anishinaabe Kwe from Batchewana First Nation in Northern Ontario, where her family resides in the community of Rankin Reserve. Lori is a strong advocate community practitioner and partnership specialist with over 25 years of experience working in the Indigenous community on local, provincial, and national levels. She currently works out of her collective, Kwewak Naki, an Indigenous women's collective based in Toronto, focused on community development, engagement, training, and program support um, and organizational development. Next is Sarah Medanik. Sarah is an Indigenous professional who is passionate about increasing capacity and social impact with Indigenous communities. A member of the Métis Nation of Alberta from the historic Métis settlement of St. Albert, Sarah is a member of the Cunningham family. She's currently the president and CEO of the Gord Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund, a national charity that seeks to build cultural understanding and create a path towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. A dedicated volunteer, Sarah currently sits on the national board for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada and advises the Indigenous Professionals Association of Canada, the Indigenous Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and is a founding member of the newly created Honoring Nations Canada Circle of Advisors. And last but certainly not least is Selena Young. Selena is the director of the Indigenous Affairs Office at the City of Toronto. She is Métis from Northwestern Saskatchewan and grew up in Caledonia, Ontario, along the shores of the Grand River. Selena has 25 years of experience in public service, having worked for the federal, Ontario and Scottish governments. Selena's deep commitment to implementing reconciliation brought her to the city of Toronto in June, 2018 to lead the city's first ever Indigenous Affairs Office. Welcome Deborah, Lori, Sarah and Selena. Can I say four powerful women? Yes. I'll now pass it to Deborah to take over the moderation. Thanks. Thanks so much. Neen Delawisi, Wabano Nungasque, Delewe Wendigiwik. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Deborah. My colonial name and Eastern Star Woman um, is uh, my um, Indigenous name. And my pronouns are she and her. So before we get started, I just want to share a couple of things that I've been thinking about this week as we've been asked to speak at a lot of events um, uh, around Orange Shirt Day and residential schools. And really, I want to ask you this, um, your understanding, your compassion, your empathy for this week, because this week can be very triggering for many of us um, because of the intergenerational trauma 
um, that exists to our communities, our families. So just sometimes just listening and being present um, is all that's needed. So just, just think of that. Um, so just wanted to just put that out there to the universe. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, as, as I shared, I am a very proud Mi'kmaq woman um, and, and a mom. And um, I'm a lawyer by trade, actually. Um, and I've worked um, in the private sector, uh, in the public sector. Um, I ran a friendship center and a not-for-profit. Um, I've sat on community boards. I've organized and participated in marches and protests. Um, and I've always felt a calling to serve the community. Uh, and that's, that's my community, wherever I am. And um, I have been a public servant for over 15 years. And part of it is because I have felt that I've been able to make change, particularly at senior levels. And so personally, um, I'm very committed uh, to um, bettering the lives and working with Indigenous communities, First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. Um, very inspiring in terms of you know, the beauty that exists within our community and our culture um, and our way of life and the resilience, um, the fact that we still have, you know, our culture, our ceremonies, our language, um, it's living proof that no matter what people try to have tried to do to us over the years, um, we're resilient and we survive. And the work around reconciliation and decolonization and ind indigenization, um, it's a hard one. And um, as a Mi'kmaq woman, the leadership journey can sometimes be, be daunting, especially when you're in a place in government where there's not a lot of people who are like you, particularly at senior levels. And where do we start with challenges as complex as our communities face because of colonization, because of the Indian Act, because of disenfranchisement, um, all of these things, where do we start? And I'm just so proud to be here with these panelists, these dynamic and brilliant um, and vibrant women um, that, that we're gonna share some of personal perspectives of this question. And I think I can speak for all of us when we say our hope is that you come away with some practical advice on how to get started if you're an indigenous leader or upcoming leader within the community or um, your allies that are interested in being involved with the community. And what to remember along the way, um, you know, leaders, you are our future and we're excited about the change and healing that you can bring about as an emerging leader. My own leadership journey has benefited from remembering three things. And I'm gonna share those three things with you briefly before I get into the questions. One, never be de deterred by the size of your dreams. As a youth, you can sit on a board of a community-based organization, you can volunteer, you can get involved, focus on your values and how they will help empower you and guide you. I know when I first came to Toronto, I got actively involved with Toronto Council Fire at the time. Um, they had a shelter. I really started to learn a lot. And then I started to get involved in the community. Um, and it really um, was a really rich experience because um, I was able to connect with culture, indigenous cultures actually from right around the world. Um, and it was amazing, the fabric uh, within wherever you are working. The second um, uh, thing that I wanna share with you is to protect your energy and ground yourself in community and, and ceremony um, is important uh, to me and my family, but wherever you find the spirit and get in touch with the spirit, whatever um, religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs that you do have, and being an Indigenous leader is incredibly rewarding, but it's not always easy. Indigenous people, Black people, racialized people, um, underrepresented groups can often be tokenized um, and intentionally or not. And for example, having one Indigenous person in the room to observe a discussion is not co-creation. These things will happen and you also hear, have to hear a lot of no's and encounter a lot of resistance to change um, the way to yes. Um, so, you know, it's patience. Um, I, early in, early in, in my journey, I was angry. Um, I would shut down people that, um, you know, didn't say the things that I believed in. And eventually I started to learn how to bring people along. And sometimes anger is appropriate in certain occasions and I've used it and I still use it. Um, but that was a part of my learning journey and always grounded in ceremonies. And that built 
built some resilience in me. Like for example, when the discovery happened in Kamloops with the 215 unmarked graves, immediately um, I felt that I wasn't okay. And I went up to um, Nipissing First Nation. We had ceremonies, we had traditional Medellin ceremonies and it grounded me and, you know, find that place that grounds you because it's exhausting work. Um, connect with your elders, connect with your traditional people, you know, take that tobacco and put your prayers into it and, you know, put it out, out, um, you know, by a tree out by your house or put it in that sacred fire. And um, also extend a hand to other aspiring leaders um, and, and take them with you. I have a lot of mentors and a lot of mentees and I invest a lot of time in that because it keeps you grounded and it keeps you real and it keeps you humble. Um, your community is there to help you and support and anyone on this line, reach out to me anytime. And I'm sure my other wonderful panelists feel the same way. And then, which brings me to my final point, thirdly, is to find ways to bring people along. So, you know, I work in the government. Uh, it's a very colonial system. Uh, and even I was laughing when I looked at the, the, um, the advertisement, even my titles are so colonial. Um, and so, you know, it's a deeply individual choice, um, but I know with my skill set, um, you know, I can bring people along and start to indigenize um, the public service. And, you know, there's some really cool things that we've done that, you know, aren't, aren't um, sort of on the radar, but, you know, whether changing the oath or affirmation of office so that Indigenous people don't have to feel like to get a job here, they have to swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen. Um, you know, so making changes that actually Indigenize the place, decolonize the pace, place, and it's very, very important. And what excites and drives uh, your leadership is for, for you to determine and um, different people find different paths to get to the same outcome, I would think. We all want a better and equitable society. Um, and if you have the courage to dive in, no matter what your dreams, if you protect yourself and build resistance with connection to community and the spirit, um, and if you find people bring it along, you can go so far. And um, I'm really, really pleased to be here with these dynamic um, panelists, uh, Lori, Sarah, and Selena. So I'm going to propose a question um, and have each of the panel um, speak to it. So um, the first one, we'll start with uh, Lori uh, from Indigenous Worldviews. What does civic leadership look like? And what are some examples of civic leaders that you admire? Mm, miigwech. Um, thank you, Deborah, And I want to thank everybody for welcoming me uh, as part of this panel. Um, I'm excited to sit here with all of you and uh, have this conversation. Um, so, you know, I think for me, in terms of Indigenous worldview, like the work that I do in my collective, which is an Indigenous women's collective. So Kwewak Naki means uh, women's work, literally. We named it around a kitchen table, sitting around, you know, literally like solving a, a problem that we had been presented with and uh, kind of an all hands on deck approach. So it was named that. And, you know, I think that says a lot about the worldview that I come from particularly, which is a very um, matriarchal space, right? I spend a lot of time um, with indigenous women working in the community and rematriating and building relationships and connections. And to me, that's a huge part of my role. Um, I'm a mother, I have a soon to be 20 year old daughter. So I really look at that worldview as planning seven generations ahead and seven generations back. I think about my mother, my grandmother, my aunties, the ancestors that came before me. And I think about my daughter and what I wanna see for her in the future and what kind of world I want her to live in. And I'm getting to the age where I'm starting to think about grandchildren, even though I don't have any yet, but I'm thinking like, wow, you know, what is that gonna mean? Like, what kind of world do I want for them? Um, that worldview that I, I, I live in much like you, it grounds me, right? It's very grounding in my, in my world. Um, and, you know, again, with the discoveries of our children um, in my own family, we have recently, after 111 years, relocated my auntie that was missing um, and went to St. Joseph's boarding school in Thunder Bay. And we found her, we'd looked for her as long as I could remember my family, you know, talked about her and we had looked for her 
and never found her. And, you know, the discovery of these children opened up more dialogue and conversations in places that we couldn't speak to before, right? So, you know, that as well, um, walking with that, that grief within our family and still pulling up your boots kind of, and, you know, keep doing the work, keep moving through, keep on kind of keeping on. And, and when you talk about that resiliency and who we are as a people, I think about that, right? That worldview that I have, that I, and the thing is I didn't grow up essentially calling it indigenous worldview or Anishinaabe Moan or any of that. My mother came into the culture really when I was about 16, which was a really instrumental time for me because I was watching her go back to school and, you know, reimagine what her life could look like. And when she took her life and really immersed it into Anishinaabe uh, Moan and into that worldview, you know, she practices Medeoan as well. And it just changed the trajectory of where I was going and how I looked at myself and the possibilities I saw in myself. So that worldview has carried me the understanding that I have a name, I have a clan, I have colors, I have a family, I choose my family. Um, it has carried me through hard, difficult times in my life and has allowed me to understand who I am in a network of many working things, right? That I am not about my ego. I am not about my own personal journey. I'm about the journey of my family. I am, you know, um, my, my, my family, my community, the nation, I'm always working to build for that. When I plan, I had to be kind of taught that I had to think of self first, right? So self, family, community, nation, that is the worldview that I, I come with and that I work within. And, you know, mentors or people that have taught me over the years, like, that I've worked within that worldview, every elder that I've sat with, that I get a teaching from, places and spaces where I've worked, agencies, organizations. Um, you know, I can say that I've worked with, had the opportunity to work with both Sarah and Selena in different places and spaces. And like, I think that the understanding that we had as women and just working hard and knowing that there are lessons and meanings in, you know, everything, um, and, and much like you, like I, I heard what you were saying, uh, Deborah, about coming into that. I used to be like hot water on a pan. I feel bad for people that had to sit with me in meetings like 10, 15 years ago. And I remember getting a teaching. Sarah's laughing. I remember getting a teaching from one of my elders, um, Diane Longboat, that I spent a long time with years ago. And I'll, I'll finish with her telling me the same thing. Like I, because you go into a room, you are the only Indigenous person and you have to represent this voice for everybody and you go in and you're keyed up, right? And you think to yourself, I need to be the loudest. I need to be the one that has the most, you know, poignant things to say. And sometimes it's just good to sit and listen and absorb. And then, you know, my clan, I am Eagle Clan. My Anishinaabe name is Gigidun Migizekwe, which is talking Eagle Woman. So it's been a lesson for me to learn what it means to sit in silence and, um, read the room and learn how to bring people along and that has come with age and experience and um, just strong women around me you know one of the proudest things I heard my daughter say was I was raised around a kitchen table with a whole lot of women so I think that worldview for me and the work that we do with Kweak Naki is really about rematriating. I love it I love it uh, Sarah um, in terms of um loving it over to you now. So from Indigenous worldviews, what does civic leadership look like? And what are some examples of civic leaders that you admire? So <clears throat> I'm going to take uh, the approach from the very literal meaning of civic leadership um, and apply it to just the city of Toronto, for instance. Let's talk about the Indigenous leaders that we have on City Council. Let's talk about how long it took to get Selena in her role as the Director of Indigenous Affairs at the City of Toronto. I'm grateful that I was along for that decade-long journey um, and that we finally reached the goal. Um, but I think there's, there's a few things to break down within the idea of civic engagement. 
And as an indigenous person, and as someone who is, who is and has been, and there's generations before me that have been oppressed by the colonial systems that make up our municipal, provincial and federal government systems, there's often a hesitation. And we see that uh, appear from time to time in mainstream media, particularly, you know, this uh, with the resignation of Mamakwa, right? Like it's, it's hard for indigenous people to fit in these colonial Western systems of governance. And it's important to think about uh, the importance of indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous leadership and applying traditional practices to these systems. And so in order to be able to do that, we have to participate, which can be really challenging when you're the only person, indigenous person at the table, and can be really challenging when you know that you were only invited because you're the indigenous person at the table. And you know, for many years, it was checking a box. And the last, I would say, six months, and with the recovery of um, the, the lost little ones at residential school sites all across this country, more to be discovered and recovered. Um, I think it's really important that we consider why people were shocked and outraged and horrified and, you know, felt that grief and that guilt. We've known, we, we've always known, and we've shared our stories and our elders have shared their stories. And it just kind of got swept aside. You know, there was one report, the Royal um, Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. There was the uh, 94 calls to action and the Truth and Reconciliation like, Conciliation Commission that, and so those that happened, I, those were released in 2013. So here we are in 2021 and people are shocked. So I think that just speaks to the learning journey that is still ahead of everyone in this country to really understand the true history and relationship with indigenous peoples in Canada and to understand how that history impacts the relationship today and how we continue to perpetuate oppressive systems within justice, within child welfare, within the social determinants of health, access to water, housing, but all of those things are negotiated and discussed within civic levels of civic engagement. And so I think one of uh, the things that I can share in terms of how it's looked is persistence. I mean, just persistence in showing up and working with and alongside and for community and, you know, having thick skin and being able to let the tokenization or the, you know, not so, uh, not so disguised racist offhanded comments stop you from doing the work because change will come. And I see it in the work that we do every day with Downey Bunjak and I can see it in, you know, being able to establish an indigenous affairs office at the city of Toronto. Do I wish it happened in a year or two? So badly. Am I happy it has still happened in 10? Absolutely, because now that foundation has been set for the next seven generations behind us. And that's how we always kind of situate ourselves in terms of decision-making and leadership. You know, we don't, we don't choose to be leaders. You end up showing leadership qualities on behalf of your community. And so, you know, what, what does leadership look like? It means answering that call and honoring that responsibility. Thanks so much, Sarah. Selena, same question over to you. Merci, thank you. Hello, Tansi. Um, so for me, civic leadership is about community. 
it, that that's the foundation and and finding ways to support one another in that community it's related to that it's also an understanding of the diversity of urban indigenous communities and in a place like Toronto or, or Toronto a very large urban indigenous community with with many folks who have been here from elsewhere in Turtle Island and beyond for a very long time there's incredibly established Indigenous organizations in Toronto and a great space for grassroots collectives. You heard from Lori and, and the incredible work that they're leading. I, I think part of it being focused in community is also about the voices of those in community. So voices being represented and, and Sarah talked about, you know, being the only person in the room. And so, you know, what voices are represented? Do, are we hearing from traditional knowledge carriers, contemporary indigenous leaders? How are we defining and choosing those indigenous leaders that share their voices? Um, do we have youth at the table? Do we have indigenous women, right? To Lori's point about rematriarching, rematriating. <laughs> um, it's, it's really about, it, at the center of it for me is community and community having a voice that's meaningfully heard. It's not just talking to leaves. Um, I think it also, I mean, I was a Métis raised amongst the Mohawks. So um, I, I think uh, it also, uh, some of the teachings I was lucky to receive relate to the Kaswenta or the Turo Wampum. And, and, and we, we need to go on this journey of respectful coexistence together while respecting and upholding indigenous sovereignty and indigenous autonomy. And so um, thinking of the, the wampum, the two row that went to that represents that. Um, the last thing I'll share is I, I, I think it becomes even more important to think about civic engagement in cities and in, in municipalities because over 80% of us, First Nations and UMAT, are living in urban centers across the country known as Canada. And so what does civic engagement look like in a municipal setting is, is of course, because of where I work, it's always in my heart and mind that I think it's really important because it's where we are, it's where communities are um, and, and what's there um, to support them. And then I think, Deb, you also asked about civic leaders I admire. So. Um, uh, well, Civic Action put together a panel of three of the women I admire, and that's why I'm here. Really, I just came to listen to Lori and Sarah and Deborah, um, uh, because these are three uh, civic leaders, Indigenous women leaders. It's not lost on me that this panel is all Indigenous women, and it's incredible to be in a space with you, Deb and Lori and Sarah. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, you've heard from others. I I'm very blessed that uh, I continue to learn from Indigenous elders and knowledge carriers. And I, I, there's so many to name, uh, but some of them that come to mind, I think of Pauline Shirt, uh, Joanne Dallaire, uh, Lori, you mentioned Diane Longboat. Um, there's also Dorothy Peters, Blue Waters, Constance Simmons. Um, yeah, the list goes on and on. There's just, um, there's a, yeah, just community is blessed to have incredible Indigenous leaders and inc incredible Indigenous women leading um, in, in a civic space. So. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Selena. Um, Lori, I'm going to toss it back to you um, and ask you specifically, um, we talk about civic action and community building. What do you think is often missing from these conversations or tends to get left out? Mm, I think, you know, I've talked a lot about this with civic action. So I, I, I do work with civic action. Um, some of my history on this panel is that I am currently doing a project with them to look at um, Indigenous people's roles in within civic action and, and, and what that means. And what we've talked a lot about is the notion of leadership, right? And what that means from our community and like an indigenous perspective of um, perspective, sorry, an indigenous perspective of leaders. And I think I told you the story, but years ago, I mean, many, many, many years ago, my daughter was a little girl and she was going to school in TDSB and she was having a hard year. You know, there was bullying and she um, had a teacher that was set on this notion of leadership with Nina. 
And I, at the time, was having a hard time with this teacher. And I can talk to anybody, you know, I have no problem with that. Um, but this particular person, I could not, I just couldn't. The dialogue was not there for me. And my mother came up for a meeting I had with her. And the reason was because she had this idea of Nina as a leader and she was imposing it upon us. And I know why, because I have a very strong daughter, you know, she um, is like me. She's a talker. She can, you know, kind of hold a room. She's all these things. But in that environment, she was feeling really just isolated and she was a little girl. So all this is going on. And this teacher sat down with my mother and I and went through a list of all the reasons why Nina could be a leader and was following this TDSB formula for leadership. And I sat there with my mother and my mother was silent. You know, I'll never forget the moment. She had her glasses on the end of her nose and she was listening to this woman, this, this teacher. And when she finished speaking, my mother said to her, are you done? And I thought, uh oh, here comes grandma. But I tell you the story because my mother said to her, I'm going to sit with you now and I'm going to tell you all the reasons my granddaughter is a leader. And she went through every single ceremony, every rite of passage, everything that Nina did in our community and said to her, don't you sit here and tell me that she is not a leader. And so I think that was a really telling lesson for her because it's this notion of leadership that we carry. And I think one of the things that's problematic is that we have to look at it as what any particular community honors, right? Okay. Like, what is your role in your community? What is your role as a woman? What is your role as an elder? What is your role as a two-spirit person, as a youth, right? We believe in our culture, and I, I can speak from the Anishinaabe that, you know, we have different spaces and journeys we go on and cycles of life and doors that we travel through and sit in and represent in our clans. And that is a leadership piece, right? So I think that as much as the person who has finished their MBA and has had all the opportunities to go to all the schools and sit through, you know, all these dynamic training opportunities and, you know, circles is no more or less important than the person who has finished a master beading project and has sat there and taught an entire room of people how to bead, um, you know, like, a stitch that's really difficult or has gathered together a group of perhaps women and men and, and whomever from the community and built a plan to work with them and show them how they can be leaders in the community and show them what their gifts are. And again, you know, this kitchen table thing, like we know that so much of what we have solved in community before we had therapists, before we had, you know, organized um, methods of sharing our feelings, we had circles that we sat in. And, you know, in our community, we had lodge that we sat in and we held space with other women and, you know, other folks. And in other communities, they have that. You hear about women gathering through quilting circles and baking circles and, you know, meetings together and what has been solved in those spaces and places. And I think that we do a disservice when we don't honor the roads and the paths that people come from. So I, I worry about that because I know a lot of young people and, you know, older people that have carried so many gifts with them, but don't see themselves in the traditional framework of leadership, right? So it's upsetting because I think we lose an opportunity to hear valuable lessons and teachings from folks that would not normally walk through the door of a place like Civic action or the city or any of these spaces and places, right? The province, the feds, whatever, because they don't see themselves in that um, kind of like lens that we've built up. Like what is success? Your success is you go to school, you finish high school, you graduate, you know, um, you go on, you go to university, you get a career, you get a job. Like that's the path that I've traveled. But I've also been lucky and, and blessed to travel cultural teachings and understand those gifts. So I just think that opening our eyes up to what leadership means and what communities call leaders is really important. And it's often missing from these spaces and places, right? Um, and I, I think that we have to, to, to really begin to unpack and, and, and understand what Indigenous ways of knowing and being are and what it means to be a leader um, 
in our in, in in any community outside of the you know more western model i love it Lori. and your example is just wonderful um mm -hmm. where you know your 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 mom you know addressed that with the teacher and said well let me tell you because we you know the leaders are in all pockets of society all like it's not about a title it's about um you know what you do and um, so I think that that's a really valuable lesson for us, for sure. Um, I'll go to you next, Selena, um, in terms of what do you think is missing from the conversations or tends to get left out? Yeah, I mean, it's similar to what I was saying earlier and building off what Sarah was saying, Indigenous voices are left out, to be quite honest, um, or if Indigenous voices are starting to be included, which Indigenous voices are included? Are there youth? Are there women? Are there two-spirited folks? Or is it the loudest Indigenous voice in the, in the room? Or, you know, is it somebody that's privileged because they've had the Western education? Um, and can walk in the world in that way. Um, I think in sp some spaces there can be a focus on treaty and territorial partners, but what about the urban Indigenous communities and, and are those voices and the rights of urban Indigenous peoples being respected? Not, I'm not saying it's one or the other, but it's and, right? And it's not, it's not leaving out voices is, is my um, main message. And I, I think there's many voices left out, even if we are offered that single seat at the table. Um, depending on what, you know, what, what is, what is it you're talking about? What is it you're gathering about? Um, have you engaged Indigenous businesses, um, artists, language speakers, knowledge carriers, land stewards, earth workers? Like there's just, there's so much, such a wealth of Indigenous talent and Indigenous knowledge. And uh, I think we're only just starting to it starting to acknowledge that um, knowledge and expertise and um, only just starting to create spaces uh, for those voices to be heard. Um, Sarah, I think back to some of our earlier conversations about the Indigenous Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, even before um, for that, when we were talking about um, the, the concept of an Indigenous business district, um, were Indigenous voices engaged, Indigenous businesses or Indigenous entrepreneurs engaged in a meaningful way? Um, you know, what do the Indigenous entrepreneurs actually need and want and ensuring that, that we're hearing from them, but as well as, as diverse Indigenous peoples. So have we heard from the Toronto Muet or the Inuit that live in Toronto, the Métis community in Toronto? And again, yeah, just other perspectives from women and youth, um, two-spirited, non-binary folks as well. Um, I guess the other thing that I'll share, um, what's often left out or missing, and, and you've heard it, and Lori's example was brilliant. Um, and thank you for sharing that, Lori. It's, uh, it really resonates, um, sits in my heart in an important way. Um, Indigenous ways of being and knowing are often disregarded. And so there is a mainstream or Western way of thinking. I often refer to it as a box or a square. And there's Indigenous ways of knowing and being, which are multiple concentric circles. Um, and, and trying to change that square to ensure there's space for elevation for different ways of thinking, different ways of managing the earth, um, protecting, um, one of the learnings I had um, a number of years ago was thinking about that Western notion or the mainstream notion of invasive species. And you hear that all the time. I mean, I'm trained as, as a scientist and so environmental scientist. And so, you know, we learned about the species that should, should be in spaces and not be in spaces, but many, if not all indigenous folks, especially land stewards and earth workers will tell you that there's no such thing as invasive species, that it's nature's way, it's mother earth's way of trying to balance what's happened. And we need to respect the species that have moved into a space because they have a role to play now. And that's part of that creator's bigger plan, if you will. And so it's, it's just that I share that as an example because it's just looking at things differently and creating spaces to, to honor those different types of knowledges. Amazing, thanks so much, Selena. Um, Sarah. 
what advice do you have for young leaders and particularly young Indigenous leaders looking to get more involved in this type of work? Well, first of all, everyone wants you right now. So, so understand uh, that you're a commodity. Uh, you know, the youth, the next generation of young leaders are our future and everyone is super keen to have you engaged. Um, there's so many opportunities uh, out there. I would say it's a matter of making sure that you're finding the right ones um, to match your uh, match your objectives. What are you looking to learn? What are you looking to accomplish? It's okay to attend one meeting and uh, and decide that it's not the right fit. The thing about a lot of um, a lot of this type of work is it's unpaid. It's volunteer work, and so if you're not passionate about it, if it's not something you're heart forward and connected to, you're not the right person for that volunteer opportunity and it's okay to move on. There is so much work, so much important work out there that needs to be done that uh, it's important to be respectful of your time and it's okay um, to do the research and to try things out to see where, where you should land. One of the things that I would also recommend is don't be afraid to cold call. This was like an old school thing, you know, when you wanted a job or wanted to meet someone that, that uh, you looked at as a role model. You know, you, you could like stalk them down and find where they worked and call the office and try and book a meeting. You know, that's still very much appreciated these days. There's this beautiful thing called LinkedIn where you can just like connect with someone and then send them a real message. Uh, don't be afraid to connect one-on-one -on -one with people you admire or people you might want to work with or be connected to. I think that in this digital age, people have become desensitized to human connections, especially over the past 18 months when we're not seeing folks in real human form. And so you have to make that extra effort to make those connections, because one thing that really scares me about the next generation of leaders is if you're removed from interactions because of the tools that we use to communicate, like digital platforms, what does that mean when you're acting as a representative of community if you're not making those personal connections? So just being really mindful around the way that technology is um, changing the way that we bond to each other and that the, the ways that we consider community. And, you know, there was, a, there was several months there where we were afraid to even look at each other. So there's gonna be a period of time ahead of us still as we figure out how to come back together again safely. Um, that it's going to be weird and we have to be gentle with each other and we also have to be considerate. Um, but we also have to start stepping out of our comfort zones again to reintegrate into whatever our new normal is and making sure that the work that you're engaged in, the civic engaged work, the connection is people. You're working with for on behalf of people. It's you care about the community, you care about the youth center, you care about the bus stop. You know, all of these things affect people and how we come together as a society and coexist together. So just being really mindful not to uh, lose, lose the forest through the tree. Did I say that one? No, tree through the forest. You know what I mean? It's it's after Forest seven on a weeknight. <laughs> trees through the forest. Oh, yes. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> oh, awesome. Uh, Lori, uh, over to you. Um, really excited to hear about what some of your advice is that you have for young leaders, particularly young Indigenous leaders that want to get more involved. Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, I echo what Sarah says. Like, I... I think that right now you are, you are like a commodity, right? You really are. People want to engage you. They want to involve you. Um, 
like I have a daughter so this daughter that was being lectured about leadership with this teacher way back when is now a journalism student um she's yeah she's a, she's smart she's got like all the like everything you know in the palm of her hand she's got all the gifts of the ancestors as was predicted she is um caribou clan she's gentle she has that ability to you know as we said hold a room carry a room um she's approachable she was raised through the culture and through you know all those rites of passage and all that ceremony that you know i didn't have the opportunity to be raised in you know or my mother um but because by the time she was born, you know, my family was on that path, we were on that journey and raising her in that way. And so many of these young people coming now, you know, they have had that, whether it's been um, a constant, uh, you know, energy in their home or whether they have gotten it through their friends or at school or somewhere, they, I believe, know more now than my generation did and obviously my mother's generation about those ways of knowing and being right there's um more access to curriculum the changes i've seen in access to curriculum opportunities in the last like i mean gosh five years like 10 years 15 years is incredible the and in some would say it hasn't been enough right but with um you know places like downey wenjack fund and like you know indigenous uh, education organizations and more Indigenous teachers and, you know, professors and more professionals and our um, knowledge carriers and our elders and our leaders having an opportunity to speak more and do more. These young people have so many gifts that they can just collect, you know, and utilize for their bundle. So it's like about really learning and understanding, like, what is in your, like, what is your bundle? What is your personal bundle and what do you carry and what gifts do you have to offer? Knowing that you are a commodity, knowing that you are something that people want to engage with, what are the gifts that you carry? And don't settle because you don't have to, you know, um, you really don't have to. You can stand as strong as you um yeah, you can stand strong in your beliefs. You can stand strong in those lessons. You can stand strong in the fact that there have been people, you know, coming ahead of you that have paved this way. And I think that's one of the most remarkable things to see is that like the access, you know, like my daughter is a student at, um, we now call X University, but was Ryerson. And it's like, you are attending the school in the day and the time when they have recognized that it needs to change. Like how remarkable that you're part of that. You're a journalism student and you're learning and growing and bringing your gifts into a time when your voice has every opportunity to be amplified. So I think it's really like knowing your worth, right? Understand that you are worth so much, that you're a gift that has been given, right? That, that you were exactly where you're supposed to be, that you chose to come here right? Our teaching is that these little spirits are in the sky and they choose their family. They essentially choose the community that they're going to grow in, right? And, and, and we know that and we, we choose that no matter how hard it is or no matter how easy it is, that is the creator's journey for you. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a wonderful thing to know that you're walking on that path. And I, I think also, you know, to be um, careful as well, because you are going to be seen as an asset. You are going to be seen as something that, you know, um, people want in their company, in their corporate office, in their space or place. And so you have the right to ask questions. You have the right to cold call and say, I want to meet with you before I make a decision that you have the right to choice and to decisions, right? It's no longer this time where you're being, um, you know, driven down a path of servitude or any of these things that most of our mothers, right? How many of our mothers ended up coming into urban centers to be cleaners, to be nannies, to be, you know, caretakers, nurse, like these things that we were uh, encouraged to do and learn about in residential school or in our own communities, because we didn't see any other place for an indigenous woman as, you know, uh, a strong leader, but we saw us as, people saw us as, as, as servants and as 
um, you know, uh, caretakers for other people's spaces and places. And so that's no longer your reality. Um, and reach out, like, as Sarah said, I mean, you know, there's LinkedIn, there's places you can connect to. I had the opportunity to do a panel um, on philanthropy with um, the city of Toronto and an indig a young Indigenous leader from the office. Um, I had a chance to meet her on that panel. And right away, she reached out to me and said, I would like to get to know you. We're the same clan, right? We're both uh, Eagle clan. And she said, I want to know who you are. I would like to get to know you. Let's link up. So we messaged each other. And I said, absolutely. If you ever want to have a coffee from a distance <laughs> or Zoom me, let me know and we can talk, you know? Um, and I felt really proud of that because I'm, I'm, I've graduated into anti-status now, 100%. So I am like, so yeah, I'm excited for these young people. And I just treat all of them like I think about my daughter and what I want her to walk into. What place do I want her to walk into? And how do I want her to use her voice, right? So the world is at your hands, I think, is the message I would give them. And, you know, it's it's a beautiful place to, to be in. Incredible. Incredible. And just, just hearing um, just the conversation here about, you know, the influ different influential women in our lives, the power of community, um, you know, the resilience, the, the patience that we need to have, because, you know, sometimes things don't happen as quickly as they should. But, you know, um, the, the journey that Sarah and Selena shared about, you know, finally getting an Indigenous Affairs office in, in, in the city of Toronto, um, you know, it's just little things, but all of a sudden you start to see, you know, our little moccasin trail starts to create change. Um, and it's a beautiful thing, right? It's a totally beautiful thing. Um, and I loved um, just the, the, the advice and the, and the chat about, you know, you are a commodity. People are looking for you. Um, and uh, so there's a great opportunity. Don't be afraid to cold call. That's cold call. That's fantastic advice. Um, you know what? I respond to every LinkedIn message. Um, and I have thousands of people on my LinkedIn. I still respond. Well, except some of the really weird ones, but I still will respond, right? Um, and, um, and know the gifts that you carry. Lori, I love that. Know your bundle, know the gifts that you carry. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, so I know that we have a bunch of questions in the chat. So I'm going to just kind of throw them around and try to share them so that um, hopefully we can get most of um, people's questions answered. Um, so Selena, over to you. How do you feel about the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation? Do you think that this is positive progress? And what one thing would you suggest still people still early in their learning journey do to mark that day? So how do you feel about the Day of Truth and Reconciliation? I'm actually interested to hear what all of you think. So part of my journey as a human, as an Indigenous woman, as a leader, although I don't see myself as one, um, has been to be more authentic. Um, and so I'm going to be honest in my answer and I am really conflicted with the day. Number one, it's a day. You cannot understand the truth of centuries of assimilative, genocidal, racist practices in a day, like, right? And so it's, um, and I'm conflicted also by um, if it probably for me, if it was still Orange Shirt Day, which it is, that's how it started. It started as a community led initiative. That speaks to me, that speaks to my heart and my mind. And it's something I can get behind. When it's a government driven day, I have a harder time. And that's where some of my conflict comes from um, because that's the same government that is perpetuating problems in, in community um, across the country that we call Canada. And so it's hard for me to marry all of these different thoughts in my head. So um, I, I sit with that discomfort. And to be fair, um, the work of truth, reconciliation and justice is uncomfortable. It's, it should be, we should be sitting in our discomfort. So what do you need to do on that day and the rest of the 364 days of every year? You have to sit with that uncomfort and you have to be honest about what you know and don't know, seek out ways of learning. Um, and learning is an action uh, and it, you know, it's an active process, but it, it can't stop there, right? So when you learn something, what are you gonna do with that knowledge? 
how are you going to use that knowledge to um, influence change in your life, in your family? Um, what conversations are you going to have? What biases do you hold that you're going to check um, and start to unpack and address? And I mean, I full disclosure, worked in government 26 years. I, I got a lot of colonization <laughs> to unpack myself. Um, so that, you know, that we all have our own work to do. Um, and I, I just, it's, it's uncomfortable and it needs to be uncomfortable. And, and if it, if it feels good, then you're probably not diving deep enough into, into the roots of, of what's going on with you or your understanding or your, your knowledge about it. So I'd start with the learning and, and having conversations, but it's, um, it's really got to translate into meaningful action. Sarah, should it be a stat holiday, yes or no? <clears throat> uh, I'm really grateful that you asked me that question instead of the one you asked, Selena. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, it should. Lori, what are your thoughts? Uh, I have to, you know, I'm tired. Like, that's how I feel right now. This month, I was saying to my friends, because um, I do, so the, right now, my passion project, what I'm working really, we're working really uh, heavily in is a project called Bashmo on Bamazajin. It means they feed the people in Anishinaabe and we do food. So we do meals for um, houseless Indigenous people and we do meals for the, seniors here in Toronto at Wigwam and Terrace. So we're doing about like 400 meals a week. Um, we provide, you know, activities for them and we've gotten a reputation for doing really good food. So we've been asked to do a lot this month, like a lot, a lot. I'm on day, I don't know what of work and I'm sure Selena and Sarah and yourself, Deborah can say the same. And I was saying to the my kitchen family, I was like, do you think our ancestors knew we'd be so busy in September? Like we joke about it, right? Cause it's kind of like this notion of go, 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 go. And I, <laughs> I, I think that I'm enjoying it because I spend a lot of time with elders, right? So they feel recognized, um, their stories feel recognized. I think that, you know, the momentum since July 1st, um, when we had this massive action in Nathan Phillips Square, um, Dash Moan did an event in um, Dundas Square and seeing these people in this city all walk around in orange. And like, I know you were there, Deborah, like watching and Selena, the crowd in that space. And, you know, I had the opportunity um, to roll in at the last minute and tell the story about my family and my auntie who was just found in 111 years, you know, and what that's done. And I, I, I think that I'm conflicted with it because the fact that we have this day that's marked has opened doors for us to have difficult conversations. But then, you know, I'll, I'll finish with on Saturday, we had, uh, we were doing food for X university for a gathering and we were set up on Gould street and we're like doing all this food and selling it. And we're beside Toronto indigenous harm reduction that is selling these orange t-shirts. Right. And they have pop-ups everywhere. And the lineups for these shirts is incredible. And this woman came up, this really kind of like, you know, busy sort of pushy woman came running up and they had finished. They sold out of their t-shirts. And she said, excuse me, excuse me, where's the pop-up with the t-shirts? And we said, well, they're done. Like it rained and they had to go and they sold all their shirts and she was super exasperated by it. Like, and we said, well, you could go to their next pop-up. And she's like, I actually need them for my kids for school on Wednesday. And I was like, then you should have prepared earlier. <laughs> Not to be rude, but I tell that story because like, what? Do you even know why you're getting an orange shirt for your kids on Wednesday? Or are you just making sure they all fit in? Cause it's orange shirt and they all have to wear orange shirts. So my conflict comes in the fact that I know the elders feel recognized. I know that our stories about our families feel more recognized this year. And on the other side of it, you know, you have these people that are just disassociative with the entire reason why they need orange shirts, you know, and I just, yeah. So I, I, I plead the conflicted. And, and I'm, I'm conflicted too, because what happens when September 30th is on a Saturday or a Sunday, right? <laughs> so the conversation um, doesn't become about what survivors um, feel or experience. It, the conversation becomes, is it a day off or not, right? Um, well, 
so it's it's a very interesting conversation because I I personally my personal view not wearing my work hat I do not think it should be a day off um, because. September 30th is on a Saturday. Nobody is doing anything on a Saturday um, or even learning. Many people may, but many people may not too. Um, Sarah, you're dying to- yeah, I'm dying. In. I'm dying because Downey Wenjack is so immersed in this work every single day. And this is what keeps me up at night. So all of a sudden, all of these partners, all these um, corporate partners, you know, that we've been trying to get through the door forever. They're coming to our door and they want to support. And that's amazing. But I need that support to be for three years, for five years, for 10 years, because the work continues beyond the day. And there's this swell of momentum right now. And it feels like a rushed fad. And that's what scares me because this work takes time, intention, and care. You can't just slap an orange shirt on and it's good. You can't just donate to IRSS or OSS and it's good. Like this work takes meaningful commitment. So the work that we're trying to do is to, okay, so now everyone understands the meaning behind September 30th. They understand why there is a need to create a national holiday to commemorate, commemorate, reflect, and respect the true history and experience of residential school survivors, their families, their communities, and the intergenerational trauma that exists today. So that's like sort of like, okay, everyone's aware now, September 30th. Now what are you going to do? So we're trying to translate that into reconciliations actions during Secret Path Week from October 17th till the 22nd, because it's right after, right? Everyone's, you know, all gung ho, they're still keen, they're still committed. And then we hope that after, you know, that first reconciliation, action, you sign up to the newsletter, you, you care about the platforms of political parties and what their policies are, with regards to indigenous people, you, you pay attention when you're reading the paper and you read news headlines about indigenous issues. You know, it's really, I look at it as, it feels a bit tokenized and some, this, it's the first one, it's the inaugural, everyone is jumping to be a part of it. I'm really grateful for, you know, everyone's willingness to support the day. I just want to caution that it should be done with care and mm -hmm. care, intention, and continued commitment. And, you know, we're going to do everything that we can at Downey Wenjack to help that journey, to help hold people's hands through that journey. But, and I'll, I'll just be a broken record for the next five years, because if not, then you're right, Deb. On a Saturday, if it falls on a Saturday and it's, you know, sneaking in a long weekend or uh, attending a ceremony at Nathan Phillips Square, you know it's going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, next question, because um, I could talk about this all night. <laughs> I have Sorry. very specific views on it. Um, so how can, and this is for you, Lori, because of the example that you gave, actually, how can educate what what can educators do to challenge Western constructs of what it means to be a leader and better support or honor indigenous ways of knowing and being in the mainstream school system. I think bringing in examples like good examples, you know what I mean i'm just thinking about like yeah I mean I, I know that's easier said than done right because um, not everybody has feels they have access to the leaders that are indigenous in their community. So how do you make that jump from, I'm a teacher, like Toronto's a dip, not, you know, Toronto, I wouldn't consider Toronto a good example because we do have, you know, the, um, we have an indigenous education office in Toronto. We have this, you know, complete suite of indigenous agencies. We have like all these different places and spaces you can tap into, but thinking about, you know, um, different towns and different places and spaces in the country. I have done some work with Downey Wenjack Fund with Sarah. So I did have opportunities to speak to educators and teachers and, you know, um, 
here's some of the challenges that they were having. And like some of the ones I remember thinking, you know, a teacher that really wanted to um, bring Indigenous uh, curriculum or the curriculum about residential schools into their classroom, but right, they were getting pushback from the principals and from the other administrators that were saying it's too heavy it's too much and, and they're like, but it's not too much. It's absolutely what these children need to learn. So like, you know, how do you help a teacher like that navigate that system around them and say, wait a second, you know, how do you find champions in places? I've always found champions wherever I've, I've gone and worked. And I really believe that like coming to the table is very important, right? So I'll go to the meeting that a lot of natives won't go to. I'll go to the conversation. I'll make sure that I'm there because I think a voice is better than no voice, right? And the people I've met by doing that, the places I've gone to, the meetings, the things I've been exposed to. And I think in every interaction, I show them what different kinds of leadership mean. So I think that, you know, um, looking for places like I'm going to pump Sarah's organization because to me it's one of the places. Well, it's one of the places, but it, it it is nationally right. Like from a national perspective, Downey Wenjack Fund right now is doing work um, in the country that is really what we a lot of what we need, which is teaching non-Indigenous people in Canada about us and about our people. And I had experiences where like, I was doing work for them. And I remember, remember the sacred fire? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, I was at one of the secret path week events and we're sitting uh, outside. They had a, it was, <laughs> it was a sacred fire that was burning, but the Canadians that were sitting there mistook it as a campfire, of course, right? Cause it's the hemp and it's the music. And these two, I mean, you know, would be probably known as rednecks in many circles. We're standing there and they were drinking, of all things, a beer. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's a sacred fire and they have a beer. And I, all the things that were wrong were popping in my head. But what was so interesting was I heard them talking about Native people. And they actually, between the two of these men, made the connection that, and they said, they used the word Indian, which was, you know, but they did say Indians got a raw deal in this country, didn't they? And I was like, wow. Not that I would encourage their, you know, language or the way or be, any of that, but I thought, take the win where it's at. And these two dudes would never have had that conversation ever if they hadn't been at that concert in that space. They didn't love Gord Downey. Because what we knew about it, right, Sarah, was a lot of these kids, these families, the parents had no idea who Tanny was, but they knew who Gord was. And so they would go home and they would interact about what was happening at school. And it was like working, right? So to me, it was like, wow. And giving these schools opportunities to bring leaders in from their community that teachers would never have known or had access to. And when, when, when this fund came along you know it opened up that doorway for a lot of them so I just think that like oftentimes people won't know to call the friendship center or won't know to call the local community around them but they look at something like um the Downey Wenjack fund and go wait a second I'm comfortable with that right so I, I just think it's about being able to asset map around you and I know it's hard to do that I know that a lot of folks feel guilty and awkward about even asking the questions but you know I think when you call over or reach out cold call a place essentially like you'll find that there's usually a welcoming voice on the other side of it so um yeah like I think that it's really about being able to bring examples of Indigenous leaders in to show people to show children and other teachers what it means in our community to be a leader. And I think before you can do that, you have to sit in your own uncomfort, which is your guilt, right? Your guilt that you carry with you because of your um, you know, settler ancestor relatives and all of that, right? But recognizing that it wasn't you that came here first. It wasn't you that perpetuated many of these things, but you have a role and a, a job right now to um, carry on conversations that will enhance um, 
the future, the generations to come. So I think that there's lots of examples around you. I think there's, you know, national places you can call. I think if you're fortunate enough to be in a city where there are indigenous organizations, you often can tap into them. Um, but I, I, I think that we are in a place now in 2021 where, gosh, like that's how I know I'm getting old because I can see the evolution of information, right? And what that looks like. So yeah, like I, and I'm just proud. Like I'm proud to see Selena in her job because I too knew about the 10 year struggle. I'm so <laughs> proud to see Sarah where she is. Sarah and I work together very closely at Native Women's Resource Center. Um, I, I'm proud to be on this panel with these indigenous women. So yeah, I just think that you have to be uncomfortable and ask the questions, right? Yeah, amazing. Um, Selena, what tips or advice do you have for young people or leaders who are feeling burnout? Um, as um, uh, the panelists have talked about, lots of people are reaching out and asking for young voices to be part of different initiatives, um, but often in ways that are sort of tokenistic or volunteer, uh, as we spoke about. And so how um, can young leaders step back even when they actually want to do the work? So just some advice um, in that space. So this is something that I, I'm, I'm getting close to 50 at years of age, and this is something that I've only just started to be able to do. And so I encourage you to please learn earlier than I did about how to do this. Um, learn to say no. No, <laughs> like it, it, back to what Deborah was saying about protect your energy. No, protect your bundle, protect you and your gifts and say no when your gut tells you, because you know that's the other piece of advice, like your gut knows and, and it will tell you that this, this isn't the right space for you, this isn't the right time for you to, to say this. So it might not always be no, it might be not, no right now because this is not what I need to do to be well, to be healthy, to, to be whole at this point. I think it's important to figure out the things that do help keep you healthy and well and whole and, and carve out, be vicious in carving out time to do that. Um, and, and yeah, identifying um, when that's not happening and when you need supports, right? There's, and that can be a lot of different things. Um, it was only just recently um, with the recovery of our communities, of the babies being found, um, that after a number of days, I had to say, no, I am done. The emotional labor that I'm experiencing right now is too much. And no, I am not asking another single indigenous employee to take this on. Um, that can be scary. It was scary for me, but I needed to, to step up and name what was happening. And then it created this space for what a dialogue about emotional labor and what does it mean for folks doing the work that we're doing in spaces, you know, where we're often the only Indigenous person. So I'm the only Indigenous person that sits on the corporate leadership team for the City of Toronto. And there's probably 50 or 55 of us that sit in that circle. And so sometimes I have to be that lone voice. Um, and so I encourage you, sometimes you will have to be that lone voice, but you need to protect your energy. You need to protect your bundle. Um, and yeah, find things to fill your cup. Uh, for me, a big thing, two things that I have relied on heavily, especially during the pandemic, and, and I share these in case it resonates with you, um, medicines. I have burnt so much sage in the last 19 months. I can't even, I've met as burning medicines, um, offering smoke has been part of my practice, part of who I am for a long time. But the, the amount that I have gone through in the last little while is um, pretty phenomenal, but it helps. It really, the medicines help me. And being outside, being on the land, connecting to the land and water. Those are some of the things that, that I, I find ground me the ground <laughs> grounds me so it's just you know finding what you need and asking asking um in order sometimes you to, to to get it sarah how do you stay true to yourself as a leader where compromise is needed to gain the influence you actually need to meet your goals i think well first of all i'm going to protect myself with said medicine I was actually making cedar tea before we <laughs> jumped onto this panel, which is funny. Uh, trust your gut. 
I think one of the things um, about indigenous leadership and indigenous ways of knowing, it's it's the all the things that you can't plan for that aren't said that are in you know the wind and the clouds and just the way you saw the hawk before the meeting you know it's it's all the unsaid factors and influences around you that allow you to make the right decisions and to stay true to yourself um, keeping your eyes and your heart open, but also knowing uh, when to protect it. I think a lot of this work uh, that I do, in particular with the Downey One Jack Fund, is walking between two worlds and building bridges um, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities to find connection and shared experience and greater appreciation for each other. But in that process, you see some hard things and you see some nasty behavior and stereotypes and systemic, systemic um, racism that needs to be broken down. And it's really, I think, important for everyone to consider how you speak, you know, when you speak on behalf of a community that you represent, so as an Indigenous person in a position of leadership, I'm representing, and I hate this, I, I do, that I'm representative of Indigenous people. We shouldn't, there's no pan-Indigenous, we shouldn't be lumped into one category. There's such distinct Indigenous um, communities cultural identities and practices in this country. However, that's the situation that we're that we're currently in. And so, you know, making sure that when you understand that responsibility, you always speak with great care and intention. And you never say something that you might one day regret because you're trusted with that responsibility. So if that means taking more time, if that means taking a step back, if that means putting in the extra work, um, I think really intention and, and being, being really careful with the responsibility in which you're entrusted. Great, um, thanks so much, Sarah. So I know we're start, we're wrapping up towards the end. So I just kind of wanted to summarize um, some of the things that we've um, just kind of shared just now um, about, and what I really liked is what we talked about in terms of how, um, you know, we really have to make a personal and sustained commitment uh, to continue. It can't be a one day, um, you know, like Sarah, you spoke about five years down the road, like. This isn't just a one and done um, September 30th, and we need to um, talk about that. I think that there's mixed views about whether it should be a day off or not, but that's not what the issue is. The issue is it's not about September 30th. It's about the personal and sustained action that we all as citizens need to be able to take. Um, it's important for leaders uh, young leaders that are up and coming to learn how to say no. It's okay to say no. It's okay to put boundaries around yourself, your time, your family. Um, protect your bundle. The most important thing, protect um, yourself and your space and that bundle that you carry in that journey of life. Um, burn medicines. Um, do yoga. <laughs> uh, learn how to cook do whatever right but do those things that are important to you um and that's really important um and connect with the land and water you know what going out for a nice walk does everybody a lot of good and put down your devices look outside enjoy the sunset all of those things so um and then also you know trusting your gut i think is is a really important in terms of co don't compromise who you are right? Stand true to who you are with conviction. Um, and sometimes the approach changes, like you said, Lori, like over, you know, as we get older, I hate to say, um, you know, you do become a little bit more sophisticated in terms of how you start to bring people, call people in versus calling people out. And, you know, sometimes you still need to call people out, but it takes a bit of a gift to do that. 
Um, and, you know, Sarah, how you spoke about, you know, speak with care and attention, because often there's a lot of responsibility that's put on leaders that are called into spaces and places. Um, so spend that care and attention. Um, and uh, you're trusted with a lot of responsibility and take it seriously. Uh, you're representing people and you're representing your ancestors and those who've come before you and those who are coming after you. Um, and we talk about the seven generations and people think centered seven generations is actually seven forward. It's not, it's actually a couple backwards. Um, uh, you know, your parents and your grandparents, and then it's forward. So people often don't know what seven generations means as well. Um, so uh, it's been a real honor to be able to um, moderate this panel with these dynamic, um, incredible, uh, rich Indigenous women. And um, I'll just turn it back over to Civic Action to wrap things up. Deborah, Lori, Sarah, and Selena, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing so many valuable insights. Um, you know, as we do approach that first ever National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, you've really given us some, some really good food for thought for all, all of us. So thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to everyone who joined us this evening uh, for your excellent questions. So many good questions, we couldn't get through them um, and for your comments. So a poll should be popping up on everyone's screen. Um, and we just love if you could uh, take a moment um, take a moment to just give us some feedback on how we did this evening to help us just continuously improve our programming. Um, so with that, I look forward to seeing you all at our next event and thanks again.